What's up everyone, it's your boy Marsman here, and welcome to Marsman Gaming. In this video, we break down the biggest gaming news topics of the week, and as always, I can't do this alone, I need the Marsman crew along with me. So, first things first, Nigella Kill, you're to my left, how you doing man? What's up everybody? And to my right is Haki, what's up man? Hey guys. So, the biggest thing guys this week, and I say this every single time we start a show, is that gaming news changes on the fly things can happen at any point and we have to be ready to roll with it so sometimes you might not be able to cover something because it just happened at the moment of recording or right after we recorded so at the end of the day do not throw us flack for that we will try to address this as best as possible on the next episode so let's get started first and biggest thing of the week was the halo campaign co-op beta and that was released on friday and essentially this was given to anyone who owned Halo Infinite uh, Digital or on, the, or on the disc, as well as having Game Pass, you were given the opportunity to play this through the Xbox Insider app, essentially giving this uh, the ability to play co-op up to four players, which was obviously is almost the same size as it was in, um, in Halo 5 as well, all four players you could play. There were some mechanics that were obviously a little questionable to some people, like for example, being able to uh, do almost a free roam up to the point of 304 meters or 1,000 feet, as well as trying out things like mission replay um, were obviously things that people wanted to see. Now, with that being said, there were some mixed reviews. There were some people, for the most part, people enjoyed it. But there were also concerns over the bugs as well as the lack of added content. Now, um, I made an entire video of my official review of the Halo Infinite Co-op Beta, so we're not going to go too crazy in depth on everything. Um, but I do want to get your opinions about it because obviously we all played it together and I, I gave my full opinion about Halo Infinite co-op beta but i wanted to give you guys your ability to talk about it yourselves so first things first biggest positive um that you saw from this co-op beta and Angelica, i want to go to you first what's your biggest positive you had from playing this um the big positive for me is uh there was a huge concern about the distance between where players can go and separate from each other and it was just slightly over 300 meters like you said and i didn't feel those restrictions when i played i thought we had a lot of fun playing um, we were able to use different strategic methods uh, when we went out missions and it didn't feel like we were constricted with that distance apart. Um, and obviously 300 meters is not massive, but it was big enough where you didn't feel that um, type of burden when you were playing. And that was a huge concern I know from myself and from a lot of members in the community about that. So that was a big positive for me. Yeah, and uh, so Haki, what do you think was the biggest positive when you played yeah, so I think just the, uh, you know, the gameplay uh, still felt uh, real crisp, you know, so there was nothing game breaking in the gameplay of the beta, which, you know, uh, does give good signs uh, for the actual release, um, although there were some, you know, bad bugs and we'll get into that, but, um, you know, we all had a ton of fun, um, you know, uh, all grappling on each other and everything. I mean, the, the actual gameplay and the surroundings uh, were definitely fun. So I, I would just say, uh, you know, the positive is the gameplay. Yeah, so listen, I think, and I gave my full review, and I definitely go check that out. That's in the description below. But essentially, the big thing I saw was the range of how far away you can be from each other was really not that not that close at all. It was actually a decent distance. And the fact that we were all playing co-op together on Halo Infinite felt like it was it was meant to be. It, it obviously should have been at launch, but the, the idea is finally getting it is definitely a, a good sign for the future because... Halo was meant to be a collaborative experience, and I mentioned that in the video. I was brought in because of that purpose to be playing this game with others, and now we finally get the experience of that with the newest Halo game, so I'm glad to see that there. But obviously, with the positive, we have to talk about the negative, and I want to ask, what is your biggest concern that you have when playing this co-op beta? I want to start with Haki. What was your biggest concern here? Uh, so the biggest concern, again, this is just a, a beta, so um, the biggest concern would be, and you had mentioned this in your uh, video, is the lack of content. So although, you know, you've played it a couple of times, uh, Angelic Hill and myself, we've also played it. So um, playing it together, you know, the entire story on Legendary, it's going to be fun, but it would definitely be cool if they added more stuff, maybe side missions, add another few bosses, you know. Uh, you don't have to get into the, the you know, the real storyline that I know they're going to release extras, you know, down the line. But anything that they could add, you know, uh, even just a few, you know, little bosses, I think would be uh, good. But that would probably be the only negative. 
Uh, so, Angelica, what's your biggest concern, man? Um, the core gameplay was strong, and we did have a lot of fun, but there was a lot of bugs. Um, there were some minor bugs um, that obviously have to get cleaned up, but that's not the biggest deal. It was probably the game-breaking bugs, um, which were the most concerning. And you talked about it in your video, um, and I'll reiterate it. When everyone died, <clears throat> like, you kind of went into an infinite loading screen. And first day, you know, we only ran into it maybe once or twice. Second day, it was at least 50% of the time. And on our final day, it was every single time that we died as a group, um, we had to go into the dashboard. And mm -hmm. it just hurts the experience. And it also hurts kind of how aggressive you can be, right? Because you have to be so cognizant of we can't all die or we have to dashboard this thing. Um, so, you know, it, it kind of hurt the experience a little bit. And, uh, you know, my, my concern is the the purpose of this campaign and the goal and deadline is supposed to be august um that it'll be officially released if they're going by kind of the roadmap that they've talked about and the concern is can these bugs get fixed fast enough for that august release that is going to be the concern yeah and i can agree i think when i did my good bad and the ugly one of the biggest uglies i had was the, these bugs right i i was unsure if this could all be resolved by next month right it's supposed to be dropped midway through season two and next month uh, august 3rd is the midway point and that's kind of where they're trying to shoot for the question is will it be ready by that time and will it be pushed to september right and that's going to be the big question and granted three for three has had difficulty keeping consistent to what they keep saying as deadline now we have to hold them accountable to that but at the same time it's like you just want it to come out right just yeah please let this thing come out. You don't want to be, you know, you don't want to sound like a Debbie Downer, but at the same time, you're just like, you know, I'm being realistic. How many times is three for three claimed that this is going to be out at this point? And it's not. So let's all hope that these bugs could be adjusted. Or maybe just like we saw with the Halo Infinite flights, that this is an older build. Like Halo Infinite flights, they remember they kept saying like, yeah, you know what? Some of these bugs and some of these issues that we, when we all played that flight to test out the game for the first time. But like, yeah, these, this is a few months old already, this build. So we've already addressed these concerns. It was just like, we're just testing out the server. So that that could be the case for this, right? And let's hope that that's the case. And maybe this is just like the first glimpse of healing out some of the other things like mission replay and stuff. And maybe that's what it is. But let's all hope here. Let's jump to the next topic. And this is obviously a funny one here. Um, so recently we went to, we, we uh, there was a incident at a pro Apex tournament and pro Apex player Dilly was permanently disqualified from Fate Legion tournaments after he teabagged his own teammate in an event. Um, this was mentioned, apparently this was mentioned in the rules of sportsman-like conduct, uh, and they say that they broke the policy by teabagging his own teammate, not somebody else, but his own teammate out of a joke. Now, they were both on the mic together, so that he'd like teabag them, like just like when I, I teabag hockey in a Halo uh, and something like that. It's it's We all know, like, we're to get right next to each other, we're on the same mic and everything. Now, this ban got more intense when Dilly got into it with the head of the commentator. Um, and essentially, I think I can't tell exactly how long he's banned for, but he is banned from these Fate Legion tournaments. Um, now, this sparked an entire debate online, and this happened really this past week about uh, whether or not teabagging should be considered assault. So I kind of want to ask you, do you think teabagging should be considered assault? Um, Kill, how do you think? Teabagging is it a, is it a, is it assault? No, it's not a, a assault. I guess the only type of assault to be is a video game assault and uh, or a pride assault. But we can be honest here. Teabagging is disrespectful when you do it to enemy opponents. It's kind of like a you know a showboat type of thing. Um, I don't think it should be taken that seriously. Um, I, I think you know people are way too sensitive and, and teabagging. Although it does spark, you know, some some emotions, um, you know, I'm kind of in the middle because I do think it's being a little bit overblown here, especially that he was doing it to his own teammate. But on the other hand, this was in the rules, right? It's not like they invented this after the fact. Um, you know, they say that this was in their policy. He broke policy and thus is the repercussions of that, even if it is kind of as a joke with his own teammates so i'm kind of stuck in the middle but the assault is absolutely ridiculous uh hockey teabag and assault you every time you teabag someone on halo are you assaulting them no no it's not assault um 
should he have gotten banned? Probably not. Should have, again, I don't know the rules of, of their policy, but uh, if the rules say he gets banned, he gets banned. But um, it's a funny situation. He did it to his teammates. So, you know, between them, it was probably very funny, but it definitely got blown out of proportion. It's not assault. Um, it's been around for decades, ever since you could crouch in a video game. I'm pretty sure it was Quake or Halo were the two games that made yeah. key bagging act. Exactly. So it's it's been around since the dawn of video games. Uh, is it disrespectful? Yeah. Whenever I get teabagged, or whenever you guys get teabagged, we're like, "Yo, this is the guy that teabagged us. Let's go get him, and we're gonna teabag him." So it's definitely not assault. Um, but do you do it? And do you do it at all in the in any pro league? I mean, you probably shouldn't because it's probably in the rules. But it's definitely not assault. Yeah. Listen, I don't think um, uh, the amount of times in my lifespan I probably teabagged somebody or been teabagged. Should I have? Should I have, you know, filed for assault charges against them for for teabagging me? No, but I do understand the anger you feel after you've been teabagged. Trust me, I've been one of those people, and on stream I've been like, "Yep, I'm going after that guy. That's that's my goal in life at this point." Um, but at the end of the day, like even if it was a, up against their policy, and Aki, you mentioned to me this off off stream, like you know, in Overwatch you get a fine, like that. It's a, a sportsman like thing, and it depends on each group. They have their own policy on it. Like I've seen the Halo Championship series, they've they've teabagged somebody out of straight up disrespect. Like they just straight up like like did some stuff to them, and they just yep teabagged you. And everyone was like, oh my god, with the teabag. And then it was like, oh god, that's crazy. But they weren't they weren't fined or anything. So it just depends on their their policies. But I think it's more escalation of this thing where it was they almost made it seem like he was actually assaulting somebody, um, and it wasn't. It's not it's just teabag. And that's been in the gaming for decades and decades. And it got out of the proportion because then the head of Fate Legion was saying, like, you know, teabags is like a cancer, like an infection. It only spreads more the time you do it. And you're like, dude, this is just a video game mechanic, right? <laughs> like, it's not that it's not that complicated. It's not that serious, bro. It's not that serious. <laughs> it's not a cancer because that's just going to keep spreading. Cancel, uh, they're trying to cancel video games. I know. It's just that it's... Um, let's jump to the next topic. And this is also in a very interesting one. The former CEO at EA, John Richiello, uh, called out developers for not using microtransactions. So in an interview recently, he came out and stated that, yeah, he's been in the gaming industry for so long. His you know, jokes around my beard is now my hair has gotten gray because of it and everything. And he states that the devs now are afraid of using microtransactions due to obviously the backlash that comes along with it and that they're stuck in the quote unquote ancient ways that is also a dying art. Right. He's saying that in this in this dying art, it's like a he kind of compared how Lamborghini still uses clay when trying to format some of their pieces and everything. And he's like, yeah, you know, it's a it's an art style that's very ancient. Um, but at the same time, he calls them effing idiots uh, to not use microtransactions. Um, and I kind of want to get your opinion here, because obviously EA was all always known for being the pivotal, the people that have been pushing microtransactions on everybody since FIFA. Right. And ever since then, they were pushing it to everyone like Overwatch started using it in a higher fashion. Then, you know, Halo did it. Then Battlefront. Then, you know, every other game started using microtransactions in a way. Um, so obviously he's going to defend himself on that. But do you think that these companies are idiots for using micro for not using microtransactions? Um, Haki, I'll let you go first here. Do you think they're idiots for not using microtransactions? So, I mean... I think microtransactions are the new wave of like, th this is how it's going to be. I think from now on, you're seeing a lot of games go free to play, even though there's a $40 beta that, you know, <laughs> probably wasn't worth it. But um, some of these games are seeing to go free to play because they're just going to charge you to get mostly artistic cosmetic things that don't make you better at the game, but and just some not artistic. Yeah. Some, yeah, some, some, uh, some do that, but don't lump them all in there. Yeah. So no, yeah. So most, let's say most, they're hope that they're artistic, uh, or, you know, are artistic and um, they look cool. And, but some of them don't. Um, but I think I think this is how video games are going to be. But they need to, and you know, you guys have both hit on this in other videos. They need to make a way for you to grind for the same exact thing. Yeah, it takes a little harder. It, it takes a little longer and it's a little harder to do. But um, to just make a microtransaction platform that's just so anti-consumer like marsman had said it's just they're they're seeing blowback and they're scared to do it because they're not doing it right and they're not uh they're not thinking of the consumer 
They're thinking about just making all the money that they possibly can, and you know they're getting blowback. So, do I think they're idiots? No, no I think that's how video games are going to be from now on. But you know, you better give me something for playing fifty or sixty hours because I'm not spending more money than sixty dollars. I'll spend sixty dollars in the store if it's a free free to game play, you know, or free game to play because yeah. it's not a game. Ellen Jillkill. Do you think that these companies are devs or idiots for not using? It, is this the same interview where they ragged on uh, uh, story games and one player? No, that's different. This, this is was, another. Um, that's another character. That was right? yeah. That was a tweet. That was a, no. That was a tweet they ragged on. Yeah. Saying it was like that meme that says, "Oh, she's a ten, but yeah, yeah. she only plays single player games or something like that." Yeah, yeah. That was a tweet by a gaming company and no, by, by 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 still by EA. Yeah. But it was, yeah. I'm just gonna say. This was a pretty obvious um, disconnect between the gaming community and the heads of these gaming companies, right? Um, he's not wrong as in every gaming company, if you want to make boatloads of money, um, you need to go into the microtransaction world because you can put in the bare minimum of effort and time and make more money than you ever did before. And so in that aspect, that is correct. But if you want to talk about cancer, you know, we mentioned cancer and teabagging. The real cancer is microtransactions and what they call live service games nowadays. Those are the real cancers of video games. Um, and that has spread throughout the gaming community. And, you know, you have jackasses like this who, you know, who come out and apologize afterwards, right? Because he realizes... They're saying the quiet part out loud, you know, that saying when they say what they really feel and then realize, oh, I, I sound like an ass. And uh, but that's how they feel. Right. It's about the bottom line. It's not about being consumer friendly. And, you know, hockey says, yeah, it's about the cosmetic stuff. And, you know, sometimes that is true, but sometimes it's not. And most recently, the Diablo game, who is a huge franchise, you know, you need to get customized things to make your character better. And when you have to pay, I mean, they, they did the math on what it would take to get certain items. And you're spending thousands of dollars to get items in a free-to-play game. Or you can grind for 100 hours to maybe get it, right? So these companies are doing things now because they're getting smarter where they're saying, okay, we'll give that grind. But the grind is going to be so painful, so painful, that it's going to just force you to want to just use the money, right? So... It's a real disconnect from gaming companies to the consumer. And quite frankly, um, it's the worst part of gaming. It's the one thing I really hate. And I rag on all gaming companies. I rag on Halo when they did it with their store. I'm consistent with this. Free to play and microtransactions, when they put in that store, $10 for a cosmetic is BS. I don't care what kind of cosmetic it is. And it, that is the real cancer. Um, and I guess, you know what? Gaming companies probably, if they want, if it's all about the bottom dollar, yeah. But problem is, they're giving us bare minimum effort. Yeah, I feel like when you're looking at microtransactions, I don't think it's, I don't think they're idiots actually for not doing it because I think they realize that microtransactions, according to first off, a lot of European nations had sued these companies yeah. for their microtransaction policies because essentially what they were doing was, was call, bringing gambling to kids' houses. Yeah. Right? Kids were basically about all these different types of slots and you know, card packs and all these things. You're bringing basically gambling, right? And kids who you're, these games are, are sold to, right? There, there's no like, because here's the thing. Gaming didn't have the policy where they have like a little tag on the side that says gambling in game or anything like that. That, that says, hey, this game includes gambling. So be aware of this. And then even when they purchase, there's none of that. So they were unchecked on all that, on all those things. And essentially you're bringing kids who are spending hundreds of dollars of their parents' money on these gambling components and microtransactions and the parents didn't even know about it until they got finally looked at their their bank accounts and like what the hell's going on here well how are you spending this and it's the same thing that we saw with the freemium games on phones it's the same policy yeah, that's the mobile just, market yeah, right there it's the mobile market yeah. that just brought to the console market and essentially like they're not idiots for not doing it because they realized that the backlash behind the consumer is what is going to hurt them in the long run and that's why Diablo is gonna get hit hard at some point. Now, here's the thing: they made so much money. Yeah, that's the they problem. They made they made man. already made the money, they and now they're like, it. you know what? Let me change it now. And now they're gonna pat themselves on the back, saying, "Hey, 
I did change it. I listened to you guys. Yeah, but you made like a billion dollars, like close to a billion dollars on the. That's amount the of problem. Money. That's they're preying on a gaming community that will be loyal no matter what. They prey on the Diablo fans. They prey on the Madden fans. They are preying on the base that will buy the game no matter what. And that's yep. the problem. That's the problem. So I actually respect gaming companies more who stay out of it because they know they can con that base. They can con the base if they wanted to, but I actually respect them for taking a step back and not doing it or doing it at the minimum. Listen, you can make a free to play. You can make the microtransactions, but the store has got to be reasonable and you've got to give a grind aspect. That's not that painful, right? Like be fair about it. And they're not yeah. 90% of these gaming companies are not fair when it comes to that. Even ones that I have some respect for and EA is leading that chart. EA, EA has led that charge for a long time. So they're pretty much the head of this BS, but they're not alone. No, they aren't. Every company at some point was using it. So it wasn't like it was the only thing, but EA did start it. They started this trend with FIFA and it only carried on from them. The new trend is season passes, right? And that's going to be a separate thing. We'll talk more about that at a different date. Um, but yes, that is the new trend. Um, and essentially, if I was looking at, and Angelico kind of talked about this, if you're doing microtransactions, I feel like the only way you could do it fairly would be that you can allow for grind, but you have to make the prices adjusted based on the amount of grind that someone Yes. Has, right? And I think, and it's hard, and obviously, it's hard to know because every game will be different based on what type of game and how much things you earn. But it's not complicated to understand and know because then you can always calculate it. Like, based on the amount of hours they play, the average amount of points they earn, um, this is how much they would make, right? And you can say, all right, well, you know, for example, and I'll, I'll use Halo Infinite as an example. And I kept saying this for such a long time about season one and what they need to adjust for season two and all and so on and so forth. Make the credits earnable, right? If you're using if you're using a system like a season pass right now, where if you have the season pass, you can earn a thousand credits, which is actually enough to, to get you the next season's pass, which is obviously a good thing from that perspective. The downside is, is that the, the store prices are way more than what the credits that you're earning for that season pass are. So it's almost like you have a choice. You can either use that thousand credits to buy maybe one big bundle, and then you have to pay for the season three, or you just don't buy anything from the store and just use all those credits for the season pass for season three. So it's almost like you're, yeah, you're like, yeah, it's a win, and then you take two steps back, right? It's yeah. like, and they'll say, good whoa, 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 but you can grind it. Right, like it's not. It's but not here's the point: it's even worse. It's worse because you can grind it for this one instance yeah. and, and get only this. Like yeah. Halo Five, to be a perfect example, they used the microtransaction route of using cards, which were completely bogus. Yes. It was like buying a real pack of cards, right? But that game you could essentially could grind for a lot of stuff, um, and they did give you the option to just buy cards too. So it's essentially the, what the old microtransaction policy was. At least for Halo 5, you could grind for points to earn for cash. And if you could do that same policy for Halo Infinite, I honestly think everyone would be happy with it. They would say, all right, I, if I can grind and gain and, dollars. And not not gain a Diablo credits, grind or this no, Halo Infinite. No, not that one. Hours like, Halo, upon yeah. hours upon yeah. hours Halo, of grinding. Like, and, and then there's companies who don't even give you that option. Valorant, you pay $80 for six skins is mind blowing. Yeah, it's, it's our <laughs> You're playing full game and, money. Yeah. Yeah. for skins yep and people actually sit there and buy it and i feel bad for him because a part of me says there must be something like that you you, you i know you're a fan of the yeah, game yeah and, and that's everything. the thing they're preying on the base the fans they're pretty because they're the, on fans, their fans. the fan like, base doesn't the want to be the normal skin guy even though that skin doesn't do anything you know they don't even yeah. get that option unless they throw in 80 dollars down to get that skin and they're huge fans so it's like yeah. the halo fans like marsman has spent money in that store right Haki, I think even you have spent money in that store. No? No. no. All right, well, good for you. I have not. Good for you. I have not. And it's just because, like, yeah, there's some cool stuff I would buy, I would buy, but I'm just like, I can't believe you're not going to give people that option to just grind it. And it doesn't have to be an easy grind. Make it painful, but don't make it impossible. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, and listen, at the end of the day, they, people can actually easily make these adjustments. Like they can easily do it. Yeah, it's, it's a not green. difficult. It's all about green. Yeah, it's 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 about it, and and like I said, each company is different in how they're handling it, but there can easily be adjustments to go from here. But let's move on to the next topic: CD Projekt Red, and this is pretty scary. Loses a lot of stock since the release of Cyberpunk 2077, and 
and obviously we already knew this but their stock had dropped nearly 75 percent since december of 2020 so they started from 8 billion stock to 2 billion um which is outrageous um now the question i have here and what i think this can show is do you think that this could spell the end of cg project red being a non-exclusive developer um and hockey i'll ask you first here man do you think that this because just think of it this way right cd project red was always a you know uh, outside of any soul xbox sony nintendo and they're just making games for everyone to buy but if they start to struggle right they could be prey to somebody buying them out essentially and adding them to their umbrella right and we already saw what happened with activision blizzard essentially their their stock crumbling due to the amount of horrible games they were releasing in no recent years and microsoft yeah you granted they were uh you know what two billion activision blizzard was 60 was like nearly 70 billion dollars uh something like, it was like yes it's around 70 billion dollars they paid for it right that's <laughs> that's a lot more billions but could this essentially happen with the cd project red do you think that that could happen because could this spell the end for them to be a non-exclusive? Um, I mean, it it might. That's a lot of uh, that's a lot of stock to lose uh, in two years or almost two years. Um, I mean, unfortunately, Cyberpunk was probably the biggest bust in the last decade. It it, 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 it might have been, you know, because there was so much hype. It was delayed a long time, I'm pretty sure, and it came out in the state that it came out, and then it took them, you know, a very, very long time to even update for the new gen console when it should have only came out on a new on the new gen console. Um, so, I mean, again, they lost a ton, a ton of stock. So, again, I spoke to you, Mars, uh, Mars Man, and I know we had discussed that you know they also make the witcher which is a fantastic again i i've never played it but um witcher which is a, a fantastic game series so they have that but you know could someone buy them out i think uh this would be a good time for someone maybe two to really help them if they only have the witcher and, and cyberpunk is their biggest ones cyberpunk's out maybe they uh maybe they get brought in by someone yeah yeah i i, I can see it happening Legilico, do you think it could actually happen yeah, it could. Um, I, I do think it would be kind of sad, though, because I know it's in like an arms race when it comes to Microsoft and Sony. And it's really those two because Nintendo's not going to buy um, companies. So it's between those two or, or a third party, which would be, you know, Facebook or, or some other group like that trying to get into the gaming world. Um, it would be sad because you do want, you know, these third party strong developers um, that could be multi-platform. And you don't want it to be kind of a monopoly uh, fight between two of the biggest game companies. So you, you really don't want that, but I definitely could see it happening. Being it down to $2 billion, I think, brings Sony into the equation. Because um, if they were at, you know, in the tens of billions, it would probably only be, is it Microsoft that's going to do it or not? Um, or have an, a chance to do it. But what it feels like is, okay, desperate times call for desperate measures. And I could definitely see a remastering of Witcher coming down the pipe to try to change things around for CD Projekt Red. And obviously this next patch, uh, the 1.5, it's do or die for Cyberpunk. They're at, they're on their deathbed right now. And this upcoming patch is with content. It has to be with, you know, good content is the only thing that could save that franchise at this moment, because if it doesn't, there won't be a sequel. Right. So it'll be either a new IP or a remastering a Witcher to try to save this group from being brought out. But I don't even know if it could, that could could get done. Well, yeah. I, and my thing is, I think this is the opportunity for one of those uh, big developers, obviously, like, uh, you know, Xbox or Sony to, to come out and buy or buy CD Projekt Red. And I think for their purpose, and I, I kind of think they they're not could buying possibly... it for CD. They're not probably buying it for Cyberpunk. They're buying it for Witcher. The, the That's Witcher. What they would no, but here's the thing. They, the, and here's the other part is obviously it's, if if Cyberpunk the next patch is good then it's obviously going to pay off right yeah um that means like all right it, and i think it honestly will be fine i am not, not saying like it's got to be think, good not fine no no but... i'm saying i think they'll be end up being okay because at the end of the day like the issue that cyberpunk had wasn't essentially the story was bad it was essentially just there were so many bugs you couldn't play the ga damn game right that yeah. was the problem but like and I, yeah but i'm sorry to interrupt dude like 
it's true what you're saying, but they won't even go back to play the story until they completely change the narrative. So like this patch no, yeah, has yeah. to be like they're adding stuff that's going to say, oh, let me try this out again. No, I agree. And that's what I'm saying is that I, I think that when they add this patch that it's supposed to come with content, right? And the question is, is that and I'll actually have a video about when the, the, this does happen. I want to do... I did like a, my own little like is this cyber, is cyberpunk actually fixed when they started adding some patches and i had a lot of people viewing that because i think a lot of people wanted to see whether or not cyberpunk is fixed but i wanted to hold off on a video until they finally did a new patch of something different so i'll do my video when that day comes but um i think they will make a comeback based on the performance of cyberpunk's uh you know new expansion as well as this new witcher game that's supposedly supposed to be about Siri and continuation yes. of her story. And I think that would be very, desperate very times interesting. Call for desperate measures, and, bro. Yeah, CD Projekt Red realizes pretty quickly their their big guns is Witcher. Let's let's change the narrative. Let's bring a new yeah. Witcher story and let's continue this. Right? Because we all I know that we forgot about the new Witcher. Right? Yeah, that's, that's, and that's the, the point. The whole right now, right now, yeah. it's like because all we think about is Cyberpunk, right? Because we're like, how yeah. bad that was. But yeah. if they can land on a new Witcher game, a continuation, the, the entire theory, and that, well, not theory, but the entire narrative of CD Projekt Red being a, just being like a one-hit wonder or being a one, like one of those companies that duped us with Witcher, how good Witcher was, will be out of the bag. I think it's just, it, they, whatever happened when it was with the shareholders forcing them to release the game unfinished or, you know, they just lied to everyone about it, all that stuff, that happened. Right, you know, we all will never forget it, and I think developers all around will never forget that and say, "I will no longer send a game out that's not finished to that degree." And oh, they say will. That it's they cool. will. No, wait, another, no, there's a difference. Another team will do. But there's it. a difference. Battlefield. The difference is, the, well, that's the thing. Battlefield came out around the same time. Yeah. The biggest difference was is that I think respectable company will say, <laughs> you know, like, there's one thing. They're live service. There's one thing because they're saying it's a live service. We're adding content. But the difference between CD Projekt, uh, you know, Cyberpunk and a live service game was that they were telling you that this was the entire game. No expansions were needed. Nothing was needed. I know. And the game didn't need an expansion. It needed to actually work. I that know, but I difference. hate that, dude. Every company that's going to put out a half-baked game is going to claim it's a live service game. I, that's what's going to happen it, going but, forward. But if a game comes out and it's like, like for, for example, Battlefield... How about this? They started out saying, no, this is not a live service. And then yeah, how and bad it was. Oh, and no, like, no, 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 this is a live service, service now. <laughs> and and that was the whole point. You know what I'm but, saying? but no, yeah, but my point is that companies will realize that you can't release a game that's literally broken. The one thing is like it, it doesn't have content. That's one thing. But to be broken, where you can't play it, like it's unplayable. That's different. Um and I think they have a chance of a comeback because if they come out with a game that's full, like actually has content and adds stuff that's interesting. It will come back, right? And it works. I know now it works. Everything in the game works great. But can you add something that will make it next gen? Yeah, and have that, it be that's exciting, saying, man. Like that's gonna be the next it, thing. We they see. fix it, and it's not, it didn't bring back the crowds, right? Like now they have to bring something that's gonna spark people to say, "Oh, let me try it again." Because they did, for the most part, fix most of the problems. But like people didn't come back, right? Because they're just soured on what happened. They got to change the narrative. Yeah. No, and I agree. I think they and I think they will. It's just it's gonna take some time, unfortunately. Um, let's go to the last thing. And these, these these are the Discord questions. I have one Discord question. Um, the question here is what is the first game you remember playing? Um, so I'll go off first. I know you guys I'll give you guys some time to think about this. I'll start with mine. Um, the first game I remember ever playing was actually Super Mario Land for the Game Boy Pocket. Um, that was the first game I've ever played because when I was a kid, I'm the youngest in my family. My two older siblings were given Game Boy Colors, and I was given the old ass Game Boy Pocket with the contrast button that can switch the, between how dark and how light it is. And the only game that was came with it was Super Mario Land, the original. And that was the OG, it, it, it was one of those classic games that you can think of. Um, and I can remember just all the songs and all the gameplay. That was the original like Mario versus Bowser straight on like dodging through. Um, that was a classic, um, yeah. and I remember that was the first game I ever played. And from there, I was a big mobile gaming guy. And then I ended up getting more into like Nintendo games. And then the, when the uh, obviously when when the Xbox and PlayStation Two came around, because PlayStation Two for us was first, and then we got 
the Xbox with Halo 2, and I was like, oh boy, this is this is where the game changes. And now here we are. We just go from there. Uh, Langelico, what was your first game that you ever played or you remember playing? It's two Super Mario Land um, on the Game Boy Pocket and Legend of Zelda on the N S N <laughs> yes. Um, and those were the two, and those kind of sparked video games for me. Um, and I was a huge Nintendo guy in the beginning. I mean, we both were big Nintendo. Then we went to PlayStation, and we were still Nintendo. And then we were PlayStation. Then Xbox came in at the end. And uh, you know, we're a variety of gamers at this point. We we have, you know, we, we play all the games, and we just like good games. So I I do want to say, and I'm going to give a, a punch back to people. I think the console wars is the dumbest concept on in video games. Uh, it's the stupid console wars, um, and that's what they are. But uh, those are the first those are the first uh, games I remember playing. Aki, what was the first game you remember playing? Yeah, so um, it was probably the Game Boy Color, one of the Pokemon games, probably the yellow Ooh. cartridge. Yeah. Oh, yellow. Was Pokemon it red or yellow. blue, or did you yellow? Which one? Oh, yeah, so which one, whichever one came out first, like the red. Well, they put the one red, blue. blue, and then yellow. Uh, I think yeah, I think it was and blue. So, was so my brother, me and my brother got the Game Boy Color, yeah. and he got red, and then I got the other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blue. Blue. One of the colors, and that was probably the first game they ever played, and then we switched, and then... Um, because he was a little older, we actually got that. We started on the PS1. Um, and what was that cartoon where uh, it was a cartoon? I think it was on Cartoon Network. And it was all about the kids surfing and skateboarding. Yeah, oh, Rocket Power? Rocket Power. So the first game on the <laughs> one, I think, was a Rocket Power, like, skateboarding game. Yeah. That was so lit. <laughs> but oh, it, it was a Pokemon for me, the first, first game ever. Yeah, dude. Well, listen, like, the biggest thing, we were all gamers. We've all started very young um that was one of the first things i remember i think when i was like four when i started getting memories was probably playing video games to be honest with you um and we all started playing from a young age and we still game today um and as as langella kill said we're all variety gamers we play a bunch like we play every single type you can think of so that's kind of the the funny thing is is that he, there's always going to be that console war feeling yeah, it sells people. People yeah, make it sells. Like, you know, they're always compete. and listen, that's fine. competition is fun. Yeah, yeah, that's all good and dandy, but I just think some of it is the dumbest. Yeah, it, it's it, it gets game. outrageous. It gets outrageous, and at that's why the South time, Park. Yeah, like there's not console winners at this point. Like, yeah. oh, which console does this? Like, oh, if you like this better, at this point, they all run so well that it's like it's about video games. Yeah, yeah. like what are we talking about? Like, yeah, the console yeah. part is so stupid at this point. Oh, yeah. I completely feel you, man. Well, listen, thank you guys for watching. This was obviously episode eight of the Marsman Newscast. Obviously, if you haven't done so yet, please hit that thumbs up and subscribe for more future content. And please join us on Discord and Twitter on you know on our, on our pages as well as in the description below. And you can join us on Patreon. We're getting some few patrons here. So really wow. enjoying it, guys. Thank you guys for tuning in. I'll see you next time. This is Marsman signing off. Peace.